Well, amen. <clears throat> How many of you in this room today have what you would consider to be a favorite place on this earth? Anybody? Anybody? Some, some? Good, good. I do. Heaven is not on this earth, but it's a favorite place, I guarantee you. I haven't found heaven on earth yet, but there are some places that may come pretty close. You know, there's certain places that we can get charged up about visiting, and usually those are different places for different people. Uh, most of us have scenes that we never tire of seeing, locations that we seem to always be ready to return to. Uh, for some, you appreciate in great measure the majestic Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And you would go back in a heartbeat. Every chance you get, you try to get to that kind of place. For others, it may be something more quaint, like the mountain lodges of New Mexico. Some of y'all like that a lot. Some people find visiting in the great cities to be very motivating and stimulating. I do. When I go, I'm very motivated and stimulated to get out of there. <laughs> Everybody has their favorites. Some like the pacifying rhythm of the ocean. Others would prefer something like the explosiveness of a Niagara Falls. It's, it's amazing how many of us have places that we love to be, love to go, and love to visit, and we never tire of being at that place. There are different strokes for different folks, actually. But for believers, for, for Christians, for people who've come to the place where we believe once and for all that Jesus has saved us, we really have placed our faith in Him. For those who have come to the place in their lives where Jesus is everything, there is a place, a particular place, a more than special place, a place more special than any other, a place unlike any other in its meaning for believers. It is rich in substance, and it's essential for our faith. And this place represents and reminds us of so much that really matters to us. This place that I'm speaking about, oddly enough, is the graveyard. Now, most of us, when we're planning our family vacations or our trips across, across the country, we don't really choose to spend a lot of our time at the cemetery. And we don't care to visit the tomb that often. Every time that my wife and I or some of our family go back down the country where I grew up, we make it a point to go by the cemetery where my parents are buried. Now, we don't go there for any other reason except just to kind of see how things are, to check on things. But there's no, no draw other than the fact that my parents are buried in that place that would cause me to turn aside and go there. But this morning, I'm not talking about just any cemetery. I'm not talking about just any tomb. I'm not talking about just any sepulcher. I'm speaking, of course, about that place where the previously brutalized, cruelly treated body of our Lord Jesus, who so recently was the epitome of life and vitality, now stiffened and cold, caught in the unrelaxed embrace of death, had been laid. To this place... Believers ought to be motivated to visit over and over and over again. I invite your attention to John chapter 20 this morning. We want to make that pilgrimage today. We want to journey to the sepulcher, to the place where the body of the Lord Jesus had been laid. We want to see what's happened there that's so significant, that's so special, that we should want to go back again and again and again. So John chapter 20, we'll begin reading in verse 1, and we'll read the, fir the, the first 10 verses of this chapter together. John 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. 
And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes." Thank you. You may be seated. As we begin to examine this passage of Scripture this morning, I want to say this to everybody in this room. If indeed you can come to the place in your heart of hearts, in your mind, where you are able to accept the possibility, the reality of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus then all the hard stuff has been done, okay? Because if you can accept that from that point forward, everything else that is said about Jesus, you should have no trouble believing that it's true. If you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you should have no trouble trusting Him as your Lord and Savior and entrusting your life and eternity to Him. Because if you can believe that God did that, then you ought to be able to believe that God is God and everything He says is true. I'm not here this morning to, to give you a lot of, of um, really flowery speech about this event. I just want to walk through it again. Just kind of walk back through this journey that these people from long ago made to this place where someone that was dear to them, someone that they loved, someone that they admired, someone that they respected and followed had been placed upon his death. So I want you to join me this morning as we make this visit to the sepulcher to begin with. Now, if you're these folks who started out to that place on that particular day, your expectations would have been very low. They would have been very low. In fact, your expectation would have been that when you got to that tomb, when you got to the sepulcher, to the place where Jesus' body had been placed, your expectation would have been that you might have to somehow cut through some red tape to even get in to see Jesus. You might have expected that once you got through that red tape, if that was possible, that when you got there, what you would find would be the gruesome remains of a horrible incident that occurred in the life of someone that meant very, very much to you. And you would have expected that upon continuing and, and concluding the preparation of his body for final burial, that you would have walked away from that experience never to see this person Again, that would have been your expectation. But I want to say to you that every record that we have from those who made that journey on that day says that something entirely different, something extraordinary happened on that day. And if you make this journey with us to the empty tomb today, then I want you to know that what's going to happen is you're going to experience what they experienced. And I call that the upset of normalcy. Now, most of us are really, we're really pretty good with normal. We like that. We like predictability. We like things to be like we expect them to be. And when something happens that, that isn't what we anticipated, sometimes we get a little off-center. Uh, we get a little unsettled. Well, I want to tell you something. If you'd made that journey to the tomb that day, I predict that you would have been entirely unsettled. And if you've never come to the place in your life where Jesus has wrought, affected, an unsettling in your soul and spirit, then maybe you haven't come to terms with exactly what happened in that place on that day. And so this morning, I pray for every one of us that, that as we journey to this tomb together with these ancient heroes of the faith, that this trip to the tomb will take us into some reality that transcends everything that we consider normal. I pray for every one of us that as we learn about Jesus and hopefully walk with Jesus, that nothing about our lives ever is measured by the scope of normal again. If your life in Jesus Christ is something that is, that is subtle and predictable and mundane, then probably you're not at the level of walking with Jesus that he wants you to be. So I challenge you this morning to open your heart to the, the realities that happen here. I'm going to point out four things that take place even in this passage of Scripture and certainly in the other ones that record this incident that are pretty ex extraordinary. The first thing I want you to see 
that transcends what we might consider normal, that is the upset of normalcy this morning, is the door of the sepulcher was removed. The Bible says on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, you might think, okay, what's so special about that? Well, there are a lot of different things about that that make it a significant part of this story. The first thing is this. The stone that was used to guard that tomb was probably a huge, heavy stone. It, it was large, and it was uh, placed there to protect, to set a barrier between what was inside the tomb and what was outside the tomb. And in fact, if you read some of the other instances in Scripture, as, the, as these women were making their way to the tomb where Jesus had been buried, they were asking each other, who's going to move this stone away from us? It's too large. It's too heavy. It's too immovable for us. It's something that we can't move. We can't handle. In other words, they saw in that stone an obstacle that was beyond their own capacity, their own strength. Behind that stone was death. The second thing about that stone that makes it a, a tough barrier to, to get beyond was the fact that Scripture tells us that when the, when the Jewish people uh, began to visit with the Roman leaders about that particular event, they asked the Roman leadership to place a seal and a guard by that tomb. The seal actually was the Roman seal of authority. And many people describe it in different ways. Uh, if it was a seal that was on a document, it would have likely been made by melted wax with the imprint of an insignia ring within it. But in this particular instance, it was actually a seal that was placed, uh, probably strips of leather across the front of that stone that were uh, uh, placed there with clay packs. And on those clay packs would be the Roman seal of authority. And for anyone to make their way beyond that seal of authority without the proper authorization to do so would have been to place themselves in danger of death. And so the question would have been, if that Roman seal is in place, how do we get beyond that? How do we deal with that red tape? How do we get beyond that authorized seal that is protecting that tomb? And then, of course, there was that guard, that, that Roman guard of soldiers that was there. Now, they were there to keep anybody from going in. They were there to keep anybody from tampering with that tomb. How were they going to deal with that contingent? These were Jewish women, and to come up against these Roman guards and to try to find their way into that tomb, how are they going to do that? So what happens initially is that this, this stone that was present, this barrier, this door at the sepulcher, represented for these ladies a problem. It was an obstacle. It was a, an obstacle that would prevent them from getting to the place they were trying to come to. I want to tell you something else, though. This stone represented an even greater obstacle to the rest of humanity. Because what this stone represented to all of us today was that death was contained. That, that death was, was hemmed in. That, that, that there, was, there was nothing else to hope for. Nothing else to hope in. And so this represents a problem, an obstacle for all of humanity. What are we going to do about death? That's a question that every one of us needs to ask ourselves. What are we going to do about death? Death is coming for every one of us. Death is a visitor that we all will greet someday. What are we going to do about that particular obstacle? What are we, how are we going to deal with that particular problem? What are we going to do about death? That was the main issue that that stone represents for us. It was a, a closed door to the sepulcher. The second thing that happens whenever they arrive at the tomb, they first saw that the stone had been taken away. Then look at what happens next in verse 2. She ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to him, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they've laid him. So the second thing that was Part of this spectacular experience was the absence of the body of the Lord Jesus. Now you think about this just for a moment. The reason that they came there, the reason that they made that journey early in the morning was to see and to care for the body of the Lord Jesus. But when they arrived, when they got to this place where Jesus should have been, He was not there. Now I don't know what this triggers in your mind, but the absence of a body is a big thing. I mean, if you have expectation of being at a place where death has come 
and finding a body there and that body's not there, then that's going to cause some consternation. That, that's going to generate some anxiety. That's going to cause a lot of people to try to figure out what's going on. And so they came to this place where Jesus should have been, but the body wasn't there. This suggests foul play of some sort. Some sort of a problem had taken place. Something had happened to alter the circumstance, the situation that they were anticipating. He who was laid in that grave was not in that grave. Now, in my capacity as a pastor, I've had a lot of occasion to be in the midst of, of circumstances and situations where death has come. And I'll tell you that in all those circumstances, and I have no idea how many times that's been, but there's never, ever been a single time when I showed up for a visitation or a memorial service where they couldn't find the body. That's never happened. That's a, that's a rare thing. It's an unusual occurrence. But when they came to the tomb just three days after Jesus had been laid there and they wanted to, to see and care for his body, his body was missing. It was gone. So you have a door of the sepulcher removed. You have the body of the one who should have been in there that is absent. The third thing that happens here as they make their way into the tomb, it tells the story of how they ran back and told a couple of the disciples and they came back to the tomb they went into the tomb, and what they saw, what they saw, the Scripture says, the linen clothes lying there. Now, if you read the story about Jesus' body being taken down from the cross, it says that two individuals were involved in that, and they wound Jesus or wrapped the body of Jesus in, in, in a sheet or in a, in a cloth. It was a, it was a death shroud. It was a burial shroud. And they wrapped him in that shroud. And, and then they covered his face with a secondary garment, and they would wrap the head the same way. Now, the Scripture says here that whenever they went into the tomb, that the cloths that they had wrapped the body of Jesus in were still present. They were laying there. In an orderly fashion, they were laying there. It doesn't say they were piled there. It says they were placed there. And so here these cloths are. So what we have now is we have a, a tomb that should have been blocked, that should have been uh, guarded by a stone, that should have been guarded by a guard, that should have been sealed by a seal, that, that none of that's present. Then we have a body that's missing. And now what we have are gra grave clothes that are present. So you think about all this. The, 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 the story is getting kind of intriguing if you think about it. This was the first Sunday morning uh, after the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. Now, if you look in other passages of Scripture, what you're going to find is that the Scripture also tells us that there was something else that was there. Now, John doesn't record this at this particular point, but the other gospel writers do. And what they tell us is that there were angelic messengers, angelic proclaimers that were present there. And they were there to proclaim or to bear testimony to the facts of what had happened. And they shared with these folks who came to visit that a resurrection had taken place. These who had had involvement, the Bible says they themselves, the angels rolled the stone away. So they'd had involvement in this event. They had been present there. They knew what was going on. And so they came to bear testimony, to proclaim the truth of what had taken place in that cemetery on that day. Now I want you to think about this just for a moment. Because here we are. We're, we're trying to rack our brains. And, and, and just, again, we're, we're in the sandals of these ancient followers of Christ right now. We're trying to rack our brains and figure out how all of this has happened. And let me tell you something. If, if you're trying to, to analyze this and figure it out and come to terms with it from the human perspective, forget it. You can't work it out. As they say, you can't make this stuff up. This is, this is, this is a, a, an episode for some criminology television show. You can't figure it out. How do you get there? In humanity, you can't do it. But think with me, if you will, about how effortlessly it seems that the conclusion of our justification was accomplished. Not from our perspective. We could, we could reach down inside of ourselves and, and come up with all of our collective energy and power and strength and might and capability and skill that we could muster, and we couldn't accomplish one aspect of what take, had taken place there. But we're not the ones that had to do it. And the Bible says whenever these folks arrived, what they found 
was all these, these signs, these, these reminders that something had happened, but it just doesn't seem like there's been much chaos, much effort, much power that's, that is required. And, and it just seems like that, that at a given moment in time, the Heavenly Father looked into that event, that experience, and said, okay, we're going to reverse this now. We're going to just change all this now. It's time for all of this to, to be different. And so he sent a couple of his angels. Y'all just roll the stone away. It says they rolled the stone away. And, and the grave clothes of Jesus just laying there. The, the, the body of Jesus gone. The angels sitting just calmly saying, what are y'all, what are y'all worked up about? God's been here. He took care of things that need to be taken care of. That's the way God is. That's what God does. So we see all these things that represent to us and remind us that on that first day, the first visitors of that empty tomb were not in fact the disciples, the followers of the Lord Jesus. It was not a Roman guard. It was not the Jewish leaders who wanted Jesus to be done with. The first visitor to that tomb was God himself who came in his power and spoke life where death had been present. That's what God does. That's who God is. That's what God wants to do in our lives. And so what we see is this visit to the sepulcher helps us to understand that it is God who showed up there that day. Now I want you to spend the next few minutes considering to, with me the victory that was won at that sepulcher. What really happened when God showed up? Was it just that Jesus was raised from the dead? Was that the entirety of it? As if that was not enough. Well, there was more. So what happens if we visit the tomb in our humanity, we see the upset of normalcy. What happens if we visit the tomb in faith is we see the onset of newness. Scripture says those that are in Christ have been raised to newness of life, brand new life. Everything is new. Transformation occurs. Something happens that makes life new for those who come to that tomb, to Christ in faith. Let's see what it is. First of all, at the tomb, we find the defeat of death. I, I just thought everybody would jump to their feet and shout hallelujah. I mean, come on. Does anybody in this room welcome death? Are you, are you staying up at night saying, boy, I hope death comes to my house tonight? I'm going to tell you, I don't like it. I don't like death. Death is, is debilitating. Death is draining. Death is difficult. It's hard. But I'm going to tell you this. It was a lot harder before Christ was raised from the dead than it is now. Because what happened whenever that, that doorway was opened, when that tomb that was once enclosed, that was once sealed, is now open, is that the ancient prison that once held everyone who went within it now has a doorway. And that door has been ripped off of its hinges. Think, if you will, of the Old Testament story of Samson, whenever they would put that mighty, strong warrior of God in prison in Gaza. The Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him, and he became strong and mighty. And the Bible says he broke loose from his bonds, and he ripped the gates of Gaza off their hinges and bore them away on his shoulders. Well, I want to tell you something. The gates of Gaza were not nearly as strong as the prison of death before Jesus came. And Jesus, in his might and in his miracle working power, tore the prison bars of the gates of death and bore them away on his holy shoulders as he was resurrected from the dead. So that death now has no hold on those who are connected by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Death has been defeated. The defeat of death happened that day. Secondly, the discharge of sin's debt occurred on that day. See, every one of us, according to Scripture, have a sin debt. There's a verdict that's been pronounced upon the life of all of humanity. And the verdict is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That every one of us, because of our sin, have been separated from God. That we're at enmity with God. And a reconciliation must occur. And there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to be good enough or right enough 
or righteous enough to be right in the sight of God. And so the ultimate question of all questions is this. What does a person have to do to be right in the sight of God? And the answer to that is nothing. Jesus paid it all. And the fact is that whenever he died on that cross, when his blood was shed there, he paid the price. His blood was our atoning sacrifice. Everything that he did accomplished everything that was necessary to overcome the the penalty for my sin, the verdict of my unrighteousness. If I place my faith in him, if I trust him, in him for me, the full and final atonement was accomplished. And, And so therefore the character of the grave is forever changed. For me now, the grave, it's not a, it's not a place to, to go and stay. It's not a dark dungeon that's foreboding and fearful. For me now, the grave is a place to rest. It's a place to, to move into. It's the vestibule of heaven. It's the passageway into the, the great eternity that God has prepared for me and prepared me for in Christ. It's the doorway to the glory of eternity with Him. And it's that way for everyone whose faith is in Jesus Christ. The discharge of sin's debt occurred there. The third thing is I want you to see that the victory won at the sepulcher includes the display of divine and amazing power. I want to refer back to the grave clothes. I mentioned them a moment ago, and we, we often read about that and we think about it, but I'm not sure we understand entirely the significance of the grave clothes. Uh, There's a quaint, nice little story going around on the Internet about what the grave clothes mean, that they talk about the folded napkin and the master's coming back. But try as I could, there's no historical basis, in fact, for that. So when you read that, just say, that sounds nice. It's a good little little tale, but that's not really what it's all about because there's no record in, in, in Jewish history of anything like that ever happening, just in case you've read that story. But the fact is that the grave clothes being there tell us a couple of things. First of all, uh, they tell us that, that in fact the body of Jesus wasn't stolen away. Now, you think about this. If you'd been someone who was there to, to rob the grave, would you have taken the time to unwrap the body of Jesus from the grave clothes and leave them there? Uh, I don't think that would have happened at all. So they tell us that, that in fact, the body of Jesus was not stolen. The grave robbers had not showed up. But, but the, the, the fact is that, that his, his grave clothes being there, the Bible t- describes them as being wrapped as they were, in place as they were. Here, the, the body, the sheet that covered his body. Here, the, the sheet that covered his head. And so the picture seems to be that the angels who were there were guarding that place. They were ready to testify to the truth of what had happened. And as they looked in that grave, they saw the grave clothes lying there, the Bible says. And the picture seems to be that whenever Jesus was raised up from the dead, that he just came out through those clothes. He just came out through those clothes. He didn't need them anymore, see? He didn't need them anymore. He, he, used, he, he borrowed a tomb for a season because he wasn't going to stay there. He borrowed the grave clothes for a while because he wasn't going to need them for very long. And so he left them there. He was not dead any longer. So this, this portrays the fact that the power of God actually raised him out of everything that was death, everything that represented death, everything that signified death. The divine power of God, the clothes remained there, but the body was gone, the display of divine power. Finally, in this idea of newness and victory, we find that in this empty tomb, the resurrected Christ provides the direct source of eternal hope. See, the, the, best, the easiest way to, to talk about this is really when you get to the, to the grave and you look inside and, and everything you expect to see is different, but the one thing that you really expected to see isn't there, and that's the Lord Jesus. And and, and the scripture says, come see the place where he lay. He's not here for he is risen. He's no longer dead. He's no longer located in that place because that's not where he belongs anymore. He has transcended death. He's he's elevated above and through death. He's gone through where death was once contained. Now it's a doorway. It's a thoroughfare. And so what happens for everyone who has placed their faith in Jesus is that this grave becomes 
the reminder that in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus there is eternal hope. Now, let me, let, I want you to think about this with me for a moment because it, it's almost like everything was reversed. When you look into the grave, you see everything that represents the victory over death, the absence of his body, the presence of the grave clothes, the angelic messengers, the proclaimers of the witness of truth. Outside, the Scripture says there, were, there was a stone that once locked everything behind it, but now it's gone. The stone represented that barrier, that boundary. There also were, was, a, was a guard, a Roman guard, four soldiers that were set to guard that, that tomb. But the Bible says they were over, laid out like what? Dead men, the Bible says. And so, so it's almost like now everything that should have represented death presents life, and everything on the outside that should have presented life looks like death. It's amazing how that works. When you come to Jesus and you follow him into his death, the Bible says if we're connected with him in death, that we're raised to walk in newness of life, and everything about our life in him becomes new, so that old things have passed away. Old things are dead. Everything outside of Christ is dead. Everything who's in Christ is life. And so he came to speak life to us. Now, there are testimonies countless across this room there are testimonies who will hear this message on the internet or television that will be able to bear testimony to the fact that on a day, at a point in their life, they came to terms with the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead and that that validated and verified every other claim about who he was and what he had accomplished. And based on that, their faith was stirred and awakened and they responded in repentance asking forgiveness for their sin, asking for righteousness from God through Jesus Christ. And there are testimonies countless that will say to you that in that moment that God visited their soul, their heart, and spoke life everlasting to them. And, and, and there are people right here in this room that if the opportunity was present, they would say over and over again, I will never forget that day. I'll never forget that experience. I'll never regret my visit to that empty tomb. I'll never, for, I'll never regret receiving Christ as my Savior. But there are other testimonies here who can't say that. There are people in this room this morning that in all likelihood, you can't honestly say that there's a point in your life, there's a time in your life when you placed all of your faith in someone who overcame the grave Someone who defeated death, discharged sin's debt, displayed the divine power of God, and brings hope to your life. Well, let me tell you something. Those who are in Christ this morning will tell you they now have a conqueror's heart. And I want to tell you, everyone, that that's what God wants to bring to your life today. Easter's a great time. It's a time not only to celebrate I mean, we do, we celebrate resurrection, we celebrate hope, we celebrate life, but it's also a time to reflect on what that means to me. What's the impact of that in my life? I asked you a few minutes ago, everyone in this room, to just whisper a prayer to God and ask God, Lord, what, what is the impact, the effect that you desire the resurrection should have on my life here today? If you did that, I hope he's speaking to your heart right now. And I hope that he's saying to you, this is, this is what I have in mind for you today. Uh, if you're here and you've not trusted Jesus, honestly, I'm, I'm not saying if you're here and you don't know about, every one of us in this room know about Jesus probably. But if you haven't placed your faith in him as your only savior, if you've not said yes to Jesus, who said yes to the cross on your behalf, if you've not owned him as your Lord and committed your life and surrendered yourself to him in faith, this morning, the resurrection wants to have an impact on your life in bringing you to faith in the Lord Jesus once and for all. Maybe you're here this morning, and you are a believer, and you know that. But this idea of the, the upset of normalcy has caused you to be a little bit removed or aloof in your journey. And, and, and you haven't wanted to be known as that radical, all-in kind of person. You just want to be sort of a sideline saint that, that moves along with the, the masses and the flow. 
And God is saying to you this morning, listen, it's about so much more than that. This is about being my proclaimer of the greatest and most significant event that's ever happened in human history. Whatever your, whatever your circle of life, whatever your pathway is, as you move through it, God wants to use you to tell others about Jesus and how death has been overcome through him and sin has been paid through him so that they can have everlasting life too. Maybe you're here this morning and you, you don't really have a church home, but you want to. You want to be in a place where God's word is opened and preached and proclaimed and where people love each other and love Jesus and lift him up. I want to tell you something. This is that place. And this morning, we'd love for you to come and join with us and be a part of what God is doing in this wonderful, wonderful family of believers. 